Hi, I'm Melissa Cobb. Come fly with AOPA. This week, we introduce you to Lincoln Benedict, his wife, Jessica Marion, and their glass star that's a perfect match for their adventurous lifestyle. You know, when you're driving, it's pretty cool, but I, I don't know, it, it feels like you're experiencing the topography and the land much more viscerally when you're flying through it versus driving. Hi, my name is Jess Marion. I am a high school biology teacher and I am Lincoln's wife. Hey, my name is Lincoln Benedict. Uh, I am Jess's husband. Uh, I work in video production and the plane behind us I can't believe it, but it's mine. It's a Glassdoor GS1. It's an experimental design, so it's a kit built. It was designed in the mid 90s uh, by a company called Stoddard Hamilton and built by Leo Leclerc from 1996 to 2005. I think that the Glassdoor was sort of, it, it kind of had that 182 philosophy of like, it's not the best at kind of anything, but it's really good at a lot of things. And the biggest deal clincher was fitting the bikes in the back because you know, we've been a lot of places, especially the old plane with so much cargo room. You know, we went to all these places and went for bike rides. Uh, and it sort of would have felt like having something removed if we didn't have bikes, because it means you can do so, you know, you can explore beyond the airport, which is so much of the fun of flying. I, I've come to really love it. Um, but when Lincoln first presented this idea, first of all, I was a little bit I was a little bit surprised, like you know, Lincoln already had a plane and I was thinking, okay, when does this end? How many more planes? But I really didn't know much about what experimental meant and the fact that somebody built it out of a hangar in Lewiston, Maine on his own from kit pieces really didn't do much to um, inspire confidence at the time. So it, like, it took a lot of convincing from Lincoln and I trust him and he does his research on things that he's passionate about. So. I trusted him and I, I slowly came around. I was convinced that it was a good option. I was still a little bit nervous that I had to look out the window and read the words experimental every time. But um, now, I, now I think it's great and I think it was the right choice. There's something about being able to talk with the owner, the person who's put just blood, sweat and tears for nine years. Um, into it that's really special and I, I think had an unexperienced, an unexpected benefit. You know, I, I live near him, he's willing to come over here and help me out. Um, so not everybody gets that, but I think the, strangely the most unexpected joy besides this is an amazing plane is that I have a friend who I really like and trust and have learned so much from. So I think that's an interesting part of experimental aviation that you just don't you know, you look at the big experimental sticker and you think, oh boy, somebody built this in the garage. But, you know, it, it depends on who it was, but a lot of people just put so much knowledge and work into this. And it's, it's really amazing getting to appreciate that more. There are plenty of times that we use the plane just for transportation to go visit family members or to just go sightseeing around Maine or something of that nature. But I think what we really enjoy is using the plane to get to places that are maybe a bit challenging to get to in a car and then using that as a jumping off point to go bike tour or go for a cool run or see the mountains and do things in a way that would not be an option as a day trip or maybe even getting somewhere that's logistically really challenging. I would describe myself as much more than an outdoor enthusiast. It's <laughs> part of like my blood. I like doing things outside and it covers all the bases from things outside that are really mellow and really fun to um, tests of my mental and physical <laughs> endurance. But it's just something that makes me tick and I like pursuing things outdoors. The more activities you do outside, the longer you get to spend outside enjoying it. And I really enjoy exploring. I have to do something different all the time. I just don't like routine. So the planes opened up a lot of exploring opportunities. I don't know, I've sort of said, it's like buying a ski pass or do, you know, like if you're gonna be in, you gotta be all in, so. It's a little different than buying a ski pass, but sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're gonna put the amount into, you know, into 
maintaining a plane and making it fly and like doing all this, you might as well enjoy and appreciate it and, and recognize those moments when they come about. <laughs> Sometimes they feel a little few and far between, you know, when it's annual and okay, you found the cylinders down and oh boy, you need to replace, you know, it's just like every, you know the story. Um, but yeah, no, this, this plane is joyful. What a great example of integrating aviation into your lifestyle, you know, and it really also underscores the importance of finding the right aircraft for your mission. Well, someone whose life embodied aviation was U.S. Air Force fighter pilot Colonel Joseph Kittinger. Kittinger flew high enough to see the curvature of the earth during his record-setting 102,800-foot skydive in 1960. He had a 4-minute, 37-second freefall and reached a speed of 614 miles an hour. He also accumulated more than 7,000 flight hours in the Air Force, including almost 1,000 combat flying hours from his three tours in the Vietnam War. Kittinger died December 9th. He was 94. Well, last week we updated you on the NTSB's preliminary report on the fatal Dallas Air Show Warbird midair that occurred in November. And AOPA Air Safety Institute Senior Vice President Richard McSpadden has just released an updated early analysis that provides additional information and explanation of what that NTSB's preliminary report talks about. The most revealing part of the report is that the Airbus made a call to the performers to maneuver southwest for their next pass, for fighters to go in trail formation, fighters to go in front of the bombers, and fighters to take the 500-foot show line. So let's break this call down because it's an important one. First is the reason the call was made. It'll be important to understand, was the call made because the air boss was reinforcing a plan that had already been briefed? Or was the call made because the air boss was calling an audible? Airshow performances are highly choreographed. They're briefed, and it's commonly said that they brief the plan and they fly the brief. So if it was an audible, it'll be important to understand why was it an audible? Was there something that happened that forced the air boss into calling an audible? Or did it result from perhaps a plan that wasn't comprehensive enough? Now, audibles are sometimes necessary. That's why, or part of the reason why you have an air boss. An air boss orchestrates the air show, orchestrates it so it remains safe, and also so it flows in, in sequence for the performance for the crowd. And the second thing is, it's interesting that the air boss called for the fighters to take the 500-foot line and the bombers to take the 1,000-foot line. That doesn't appear to be what we saw on the tapes. Now, it could be the perspective of the videotapes that we were viewing, but it doesn't look like it. It actually looks like the opposite is happening, that fighters are going to the 1,000-foot line and bombers were headed to the 500-foot line. So if the NTSB report is correct and the air boss made that call, it'll be important to understand, was everybody abiding by the air boss's call? Did everybody hear the call? Was it acknowledged so that all the players involved could maneuver in accordance with the air boss's directive? And then it would have been incumbent upon the, the fighter flight lead to move his entire formation to deconflict and get in front of the bombers. And then it would have been especially important for number three, the P-63 King Cobra, to make sure that his flight path was clear and he was rolling out in front of the first bomber. One aspect the preliminary report didn't address is there's a video surfacing around the internet that shows potentially an object impacted the P-63 just before it impacted the B-17. We're hopeful that the NTSB can look at that video and either validate it or discredit it, whichever is appropriate. Either way, it doesn't really explain why the P-63 is floating its turn wider than the fighters in front of it. So, it may help shed some light on what went on in the P-63 right before the impact. There's still a question as to why the P-63 was where it was in, in that piece of sky. There's been a lot of comments and a lot said about altitude deconfliction. Altitude deconfliction isn't always used in air shows. So in air shows, there are three primary ways to provide deconfliction. There's lateral show lines like we talked about and they were using in the 500 and the 1,000 foot show lines. 
there's sequential separation where one flight comes in before another, they follow each other, and then there's vertical separation. So vertical separation isn't always used. You don't always need all three of those as separation. And even when vertical separation is used, it's usually used in reference to a visual pickup. So for example, it will be fighters fly on top of the bombers or fighters higher than the bombers. In, in any case, they have, to pick, they have to make the visual pickup to provide the vertical deconfliction. So in this case, given the P-63 didn't see the B-17, it's not clear that vertical separation would have helped prevent this mishap. Preliminary reports are just that, preliminary, and oftentimes they create a lot of questions as this one did. Thanks, Richard. As always, we appreciate your insights and the lessons that we can learn from them. Well, watching aviation safety videos is a great way to become a safer pilot, but nothing really beats flying regularly. And I had the chance to go flying twice this week. That's a whew, luxury for me. Um, one of those times was in the 170. And this time I just went out and I, I did maneuvers. I did slow flight, power off stalls, power on stalls, and steep turns. Well, there's an instructor, Bruce Williams, in the Seattle area who has a new take on teaching steep turns, and he says it makes it easier for students to grasp. Let's take a look. Often we confuse the purpose of a maneuver with the standard by which it is judged. Let's talk about steep turns. The Airplane Flying Handbook explains the purpose of steep turns this way. The objective of the steep turn is to develop a pilot's skill in flight control smoothness and coordination, an awareness of the airplane's orientation to outside references, division of attention between flight control applications, and the constant need to scan for hazards and other traffic in the area. More specifically, steep turns help you understand higher g-forces experienced during a turn, an airplane's inherent overbanking tendency when the bank angle exceeds 30 degrees, the significant loss of the vertical component of lift when the wings are steeply banked, substantial pitch control pressures, and the need for additional power to maintain airspeed during the turn. To learn and understand those objectives, Clear the area in the direction you want to turn and smoothly roll into a 20 degree bank. Continue that shallow bank as you observe and hold the slight pitch up required to maintain altitude without adding trim. Continue the turn using 20 degrees of bank through 90, 180, or even 360 degrees to get the picture while looking for traffic, monitoring the airplane, and noting your progress through the turn. Next, without returning to wings level, smoothly steepen the bank to 30 degrees. Note the slight additional back pressure required, without using trim, to maintain altitude as the bank angle and load factor increase. Add power as necessary. Stay at that bank angle until you can observe and consistently hold the new pitch attitude. When you're ready to try a real steep turn, again, without rolling back to wings level, smoothly increase the bank angle to 45 degrees. As before, add back pressure without using trim to establish the pitch attitude required to hold altitude. Smoothly increase power as needed. Practice decreasing and increasing the bank angle plus or minus 5 degrees to vary the lift vector and maintain altitude. Note the pitch attitude and power setting required to fly level at 45 degrees of bank. You'll find that you're flying steep turns within standards without all the fuss usually associated with the maneuver. And you'll have time to meet the other goals of the maneuver, such as looking for traffic. To roll out of a steep turn, reverse the process. Smoothly reduce the bank angle from 45 to 30 degrees, then to 20 degrees, and finally to wings level, while decreasing pitch and power to maintain altitude and airspeed. At first, don't obsess about ending on a specific heading. Focus instead on the sight picture, power settings, and the feel of the control pressures as you return to wings level flight. After practicing this incremental technique a few times, you can go directly from straight and level to 30 degrees of bank, or all the way to 45 degrees because you know the pitch and power targets, and you'll be able to anticipate smoothly rolling out of steep turns on the starting heading without ballooning or accelerating. Pilots often find this approach to steep turns helps them quickly master the maneuver, regardless of the type of aircraft. Because the changes in pitch and power are incremental, steep turns don't feel rushed, and the gradually increasing control forces are easy to manage without trim. And most important, you understand the purpose of practicing steep turns. All right, thanks, Bruce. That's a really neat way to look at doing steep turns. I'm going to have to try that out the next time I go flying. Well, if you live in an area where you think you would benefit from having weather cams, 
The FAA wants to know, so they already have over 230 weather cams set up in Alaska, 11 now in Hawaii. There are more and more third-party weather cams popping up in Colorado and Montana. And AOPA has been surveying pilots and has found that if weather cams are available in their areas, they're increasingly using them in their pre-flight briefings. So uh, the FAA has a web portal set up where you can send them uh, the area you'd like to have a weather cam and why. So just go to the link in our description below. That'll take you to our story about this where you can get more details and you'll be able to access that web form from there to send in your information. All right, well, this past weekend was the vintage flying at the Massey Aerodrome and AOPA video content producer Sierra Harrop takes us along. Today we are at Massey Aerodrome for their annual open hangar fly-in day. Let's check it out. The first thing you notice is that your airplane is not the coolest one here, unless of course it is. Uh, it's a beautiful day and they've got a great little uh, operation here, so I flew the steerman over and yeah, I try to come whenever I can make when they're flying. So, What's the steerman like in 40 degree weather? Very cold. <laughs> With lots of layers, uh, snow pants, and but uh, you know, we made it work. So. Massey Aerodrome has a good museum that doubles as a space to sit and eat with friends. It's a nice spot to warm up on a cold day. Sitting and chatting with old friends and making new ones surrounded by cool airplanes is a truly great way to spend the day. Flew in a 1963 172. Nice, so you had cabin heat. Yeah, I did have cabin heat and carb heat, all the heats. Yeah, you tell this guy about the virtues of cabin heat, I guess. Well, it's actually his airplane. Oh, well, there in. you go, it works out, it works out. He was supposed to come with me, but he chickened out. So yeah, well, I was I was ferrying, busy ferrying another plane home, so. If I was summoning a ride today, I'd be asking you. Yeah, no thank you, buddy. expecting so I'm gonna cool. enjoy it well we just landed so we're gonna walk around see what's here and there's plenty wow what a collection of vintage aircraft that showed up for the event and Sierra I understand you've been trying to go to this for a couple of years what is it about this event that sets it apart well a lot of my friends have been going to it and I've heard about this event for years and years from all my DC area pilot friends and I've never made it to it either for weather or scheduling or whatever and I finally did, and it's great. It's this cool grass aerodrome kind of on the north side of the eastern shore of Maryland at the very top of the Delmarva Peninsula. So it's a scenic flight to get over there. It's a grass runway, and I'd never been there, so I was trying to spot it, and a couple miles out, you just notice this row of really cool vintage airplanes, everybody that had come in before you. And, you know, I fly this RV-12 as often as I can to these events. And usually it's a pretty cool machine. People like to look at it. I landed there and it was not at all the star of the show, rightfully so, because there's so many airplanes that are much cooler. And you just soak it up and see all these amazing machines and the neat people behind them. And it's just a cool little gathering. Oh, neat. Now, do they offer events throughout the year? Yeah, they've got events throughout the year, a chilly fly-in in May, a vintage fly-in in June, and then the first Sunday of December is their open hangar fly-in. That's what we were there for, a really great spot. Got a museum, they got a grass strip. It's really cool to go check out. Awesome. All right, and uh, we'll drop a link to the Massey Aerodrome events page down in our description so that if folks want to drop in, they can uh, check out the exact dates. So, cool. Well, thanks, Sierra. Sure. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Fly with AOPA. Be sure to like and subscribe so you can stay up to date on all our latest videos. And this week, we leave you with footage from viewer Mike Young. Get ready for some cuteness overload. He sent in footage from a puppy rescue flight. So he flies puppies from overcrowded shelters and rescues in Alabama to Central Florida. And that there, they're nurtured and then put up for adoption. So thank you for that flying that you do, Mike, and for sending that video. So be sure to send in your favorite flying videos at the link in the description. You just might see them on an upcoming show. And as always, if you're not already an AOPA pilot, we'd love for you to join us. Click on the link at the end of the video to learn more.